chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. I'll just read the Sanskrit and the translation and the purpose. Shisuko vacha ekada griha dashishu yashoda nanda gehini kamantara niyukta su nirmamanta swayam dadhi yani yani hagitani tad bala charitani cha dadhi nirmantane kale smaranti tani agayate agayata. Translation and purport by His Divine Grace Yasiva Pilanta Swami Srila Prabhupada. Sri Sukadev Goswami continued, One day, when Mother Yashoda saw that all the maid servants were engaged in other household affairs, she personally began to churn the yogurt. While churning, she remembered the childish activities of Krishna, and in her own way she composed songs and enjoyed singing to herself about all those activities. Purport. Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur, quoting from the Vaishnava Toshani, of Srila Sanatana Goswami says that the incident of Krishna's breaking the pot of yogurt and being bound by Mother Yashoda took place on the Deepavali day or Deepa Malika. Even today in India, this festival is generally celebrated very gorgeously in the month of Kartik by fireworks and lights, especially in Bombay. It is to be understood that among all the cows of Nanda Maharaj, several of Mother Yashoda's cows ate only grasses so flavorful that the grasses would automatically flavor the milk. Mother Yashoda wanted to collect the milk from these cows, make it into yogurt, and churn it into butter personally, since she thought that this child Krishna was going to the houses of neighborhood gopas and gopis to steal butter because he did not like the milk and yogurt ordinarily prepared. While churning the butter, Mother Yashoda was singing about the childhood activities of Krishna. It was formerly a custom that if one wanted to remember something constantly, he would transform it into poetry or have this done by a professional poet. It appears that Mother Yashoda did not want to forget Krishna's activities at any time. Therefore, she poeticized all of Krishna's childhood activities, such as the killing of Putna, Agasura, Sakadasura, and Trinavartha. And while churning the butter, she sang about these activities in poetical form. This should be the practice of persons eager to remain Krishna conscious 24 hours a day. This incident shows how Krishna conscious Mother Yashoda was. To stay in Krishna consciousness, we should follow such persons. Om Jnana Timidandasya Jnanam Jnana Shalakaya Chakshun Vinna Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Mano Vishtam Sthapitam Yena Kutale Svayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Sava Padantikam Mahadeham Shri Guru Shri Yuta Padakamam Shri Guru Vaishnavam Sha, Shri Rupam Sagrajatam, Sahaganatam, Vitam Tam Sajivam, Sadvaitam, Sabadutam, Padijana Saitam, Krishna Chaitanya Devam, Shri Radha Krishna Padam, Sahaganatam, Shri Shapanitam Sha, Hey Krishna Karna Sindhu, Nina Bandhu Jagatpate, Gopesha Gopika Kanta, Rahala Kanta Namostate, Tapta Ramchana Gorangi, Rade Vrinda Maneshwari, Vrishavanu Sude Devi, Pranamami Hari Kire, Vanja Kalvataru Yasha, Kripa Sindhu Gevacha, Patitana month of Kartik. So there's a lot of glories described in the different Puranas about the amazing potency of Kartik and how even if you do just a little devotional service, it can have tremendous benefits. So one 
such glorification comes from the Padma Purana. It says, if one offers a little wor wor worship to Krishna in this month, just a little worship, Krishna offers that person his own abode. A little. Whatever that little may be is very different for everyone. Another one, glorification from the Skanda Purana, if someone burns a ghee lamp in the temple, even for a short time, see everything is shortened, just a little, just a short time, see? <laughs> then whatever sins he has acquired from millions of kalpas, one kalpa is 1,000 yugas, are all destroyed. All destroyed for 1,000 yugas. So a lot of, you know, benefits and uh, sort of, uh, you know, inspirations being given here that we take this month of Karthik seriously and we do a little bit more than we normally do. Associate with devotees, read a little more, chant a little more, something a little bit more. So, and if you're not doing anything, this is a great time to start. If you, this, you're coming to the temple for the first time, this is an incredible, wonderful time for you to come to the temple. And, of course, this is the month of, Kar month of Karthik is not different from Radharani. And all spiritual activities are multiplied by a thousand times. So it's, uh, you know, as uh, devotees like to say, it's like the, it's the ultimate buy one, get a thousand free sort of, uh, you know, that's our famous statement that we hear in every class probably. Right? Buy one, get a thousand free. So that's kind of what's happening here. And in the, in the verse that we read today, so Mother Yashoda was thinking that maybe Krishna's not satisfied at home. And that's why he's running around everywhere, uh, eating in everyone else's home. Well, it's just not that he's eating at everyone's home by their invitation. <laughs> it's one thing to eat in people's homes if you're invited to eat. But Krishna wasn't waiting for invitations. Because he knew that in one sense that, that everybody wanted him there. So he would just go. And so many of the gopis were determined that, you know, we, they were complaining to Mother Yashoda. And they thought that, you know, we have to just really catch him because we can never catch him. So one gopi decided that I know he's going to come and steal the butter. And so she hung the butter in, in the pot, hanging from the ceiling, and then she put a bell underneath because she knew Krishna was very tricky. But how is he going to get the butter without the bell going off? So Krishna shows up with his group of friends as he usually travels in a gang. <laughs> And so he decides that he's going to get this butter. He sees the bell. He realizes, okay, so there's some trickery here. And the door was wide open, so everything is wide open. He, he can walk right in. So that right there is a little suspicious. Why is the door open? And so then he gets up there. He climbs up and starts to reach for the butter. And then he holds the, the little tongue of the bell. You know, he holds that. And now the bell's not going to ring. So he's taking all the butter out, giving it to his friends and everything. And after his friends are satisfied, he decides that, well, it's my turn. But, but he needed to use both hands at this point. So he's thinking about, what am I going to do? How am I going to get this butter and not get caught? So he basically, it was very simple. He told the bell, don't ring. <laughs> and the bell's like, okay. So then Krishna now can safely and comfortably use both hands, shake the pot all he wants, and get as much butter out as possible. He'd start taking the butter out. The moment he put the butter in his mouth, the bell started ringing wildly. And Krishna got really upset at the bell and said, I told you not to ring. The bell says, you know, I'm just used to ringing whenever God eats. I couldn't help myself. You know, I just can't help it. This is God eats, I ring. I just, I couldn't stop myself. That's what I'm supposed to do all the time. So, and of course, then the gopi came running. So, ah, I caught you. The friends were gone, of course. Right? And so she grabbed Krishna's hand and she wanted to take the pot of butter as proof that, look, my pot of butter is empty and your son ate it. She's grabbed Krishna by the hand and she's going over to Mother Yashoda's home. Like, okay, I've caught your son red-handed. And she had the pot and proof and everything. And Krishna's like, Slow down, slow down. You're walking so fast, I can't keep up with you. Like, okay, so she picks him up and you know, puts him right here on her hip. And then she's having a hard time holding him and the butter pot. And so she says, okay, you hold the butter pot and I'm just going to carry you. So this was a perfect arrangement. So he's holding the butter pot, she's holding him. Now he's getting to ride and eat at the same time. <laughs> you know how it's like, like uh, you know, you go on like... Uh, 
a journey and it's kind of more fun to eat when you're on the go sort of you know like especially in India right on the trains you're on the train and that's when you break out the food and you eat because it's more fun so now Krishna's not only getting to eat but he's also getting a free ride so it's like the ultimate the best of both worlds so then he's eating while he's on her hip and now finally she arrives and says mother Yashoda come I want to show you something I want to show you something come quickly mother Yashoda comes running out and then right behind her comes Krishna. And now this gopi is confused, like, how is Krishna there? She looks on her hip, it's her own son. <laughs> and she's really confused. She doesn't know what to say. So this is one beautiful pastime of Krishna in which he's never really caught. He's caught, but never really caught. And then there's another time where Krishna is just constantly going from home to home to home. And one time this gopi walks in and she sees that Krishna's got his entire hand and head inside the butter pot. And he's remember as a little kid. So just this kid's like fully inside, you know, bent over, head and arm inside the pot. And she's just looking like, okay, you know, this is too much. And she says, hey, thief, what do you think you're doing? And then Krishna says, you know, he comes out, you know, with butter all over him. He said, like, what do you mean thief? Who are you calling a thief? Look what's happening in this day and age. Someone is trying to do some service to others, and then they get called a thief. I'm trying to do some very valuable service here, and you're blaming me? She said, what seva are you doing? What service could you possibly be doing with your head in my butter pot? <laughs> he says, well, let me tell you what service I'm doing. There's ants in your butter. <laughs> and because I'm trying to take out these ants, I'm doing val very valuable service. Because who's going to eat butter that has ants in it? So this butter is completely useless and he just walks out. So this is the way Krishna is performing his pastimes. Traveling home to home and having different and unique pastimes with each and every gopi. So the complaints get to Mother Yashoda eventually. And what she realizes is that she's thinking that again, maybe Krishna's just not getting enough good quality butter here. So maybe I need to do a little extra to make sure that Krishna's satisfied at home. So what she does is she has these special, that the, the purport was described, she has these thousand cows eating this very, very special sweet grass. And the milk from those thousand cows would be given to a hundred of the best cows that she had. And then the milk from those cows would be given to the 10 top cows that they had. And the milk from that would be given to the best cow that they had. And then the milk from there is what she would use. And this was the best milk, the most nectarian milk. And this is the milk that Mother Yashoda would use to make the yogurt and from that churn the butter. So this was a lot of work that was going into producing this milk and this yogurt and this, and this butter just so that Krishna could be happy with all their offerings. So there was a lot of work, a lot of attention was going into this. And so one time, of course, as the pastime goes, Mother Yashoda was singing. You know, she was coming up with poetry on the spot. I mean, who can really do that? She was remembering Krishna's pastime and singing him in a way as if it was poetry. So she's singing and remembering Krishna's pastimes and singing about them to herself while churning the yogurt into butter. And then of course, Krishna wakes up, he's hungry, he's pulling on her sari, indicating that your first business is to take care of me, to feed me. And of course, Mother Yashoda immediately picks him up and starts to breastfeed him. And while he's feeding, She's looking at his beautiful face. And there's this incredible exchange of love taking place. And then in that moment, of course, the milk that's on the stove starts to boil over. Now it's explained that the milk was thinking that Mother Yashoda has unlimited love for Krishna. And because she has unlimited love for Krishna, she has unlimited milk for Krishna. If he's always going to drink her milk, how in the world can he ever drink me? So what's the use of me living? 
So the milk decided just to jump off and commit suicide and jump into the fire. So during this process of committing suicide, the milk was making a big mess everywhere. Because you know, has anybody, probably no one here has done this, has anybody tried to boil milk and it spilled over? <laughs> Everyone's done this, right? And I think we, a lot of us have been sort of maybe standing right there on the phone, right in front of the stove, and then you know, you're talking, 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 and you're like, oh, oh, hold on a second, right? So the milk started boiling over, so he, she was boiling this milk for Krishna, so she put him down immediately and went to take care of the milk. Now, you know, I'm sure those of you with children, right, if in the middle of their feeding, you take away their bottle or food, I'm sure that's not gonna be a fun experience. Like they're in the middle of feeding, it's not like they're done. They're absorbed eating and you just take away their plate or take out their bottle, right? Um, and if you haven't, you know, I'm sure you've done that or accidentally, and they just, you know, it's gonna be a, quite a scene created. So Krishna gets pretty upset because he's playing the role of an ordinary child. That's what he was there to do. Act just like an ordinary child. And so when he gets upset, he takes a rock, breaks that pot of butter, and he realizes that, okay, this is going to be problematic. Just like when kids, when they make a mistake, they know that they've made a mistake. You don't have to tell them that. They pretty much know at a certain age that they've made a mistake. And then he, of course, runs. Mother Yashoda comes back, sees the big mess, and, you know, and she sees that there's a, he was all over that butter. So there's buttery footprints. So she uses her whole detective sense to figure out, if I follow these footprints, it'll probably lead me to Krishna. Right? So she follows those footprints and she sees Krishna is standing on a grinding mortar and not only first of all he's feeding the butter to the monkeys can you imagine you spend hours and hours and hours making something and you then you see your kid feeding it to the dog if you have a dog if you don't maybe you have a cat whatever it is non-human entity <laughs> you spend four or five hours making something right Burphy or whatever it is, and your kid is feeding it to the dog, right? So, now, she's not very thrilled about this, so he's eating, he's feeding it to the monkeys and everything, and then of course, he's, and of course he's worried, he's looking around, because he knows what he's doing is not the best thing. <laughs> he broke one pot of butter, and now he's giving away the other one. And this is a lot of work, because remember, those thousand cows, and then the hundred cows, and then the ten cows, and then the one cow, and then the milk, and then the yogurt, and the butter. So that's just days and weeks worth of preparation out the window into the mouths of monkeys, right? That's what's kind of happening here. And so she chases him, right? And as she's chasing him, and she's chasing Krishna, and it's really hard for her because she's wearing all these ornaments, she's nicely dressed, she can't keep up with him. She's perspiring, it's so difficult. And the flowers from her hair are falling, and it's explained that the flowers are thinking that this is, who is this mother Yashoda? How is it that she's chasing Krishna? How is she chasing the Supreme Personality of Godhead? Everybody, fear personified, runs from Krishna. How is she chasing after God? She's so glorious, we shouldn't be on her head, we should be at her feet. So they jump off to get to her feet. And finally, she catches Krishna. And he said, I'm sorry, I did it. It was my fault. Very nice after you've been caught, right? <laughs> because what, if you lie at this point, things could get worse. <laughs> he said, I did it, it's my fault. You know, I broke the pot. And so, and then she, he's like, please don't hit me because she's got a stick also in her hand. You know? She's got a stick in her hands. And so she realizes that he's really scared. He's really scared. And, you know, of course, when you tell the story in the West, people are like, oh my gosh. You tell it in India, it's totally normal. You know, yes, that's all right. How come she didn't have a stick? Why'd you throw it away? <laughs> right? So, so she throws away the stick because she sees he's really, really scared. And she doesn't want to frighten him too much. And she knows that she's, she's got a lot of work to do. And she's not going to get any of it done if he's running around breaking pots and feeding everything in the home to the monkeys. So she takes a rope takes the grinding mortar, ties one end to the grinding mortar, and is, of course, trying to get it around his waist. It's not making it around. It's two inches too short. And we know that in this 
what these two inches stand for. One inch stands for the devotee's endeavor, and the other stands for Krishna's mercy. And so you can see, even a pure devotee, a nitya siddha, eternally liberated personality like Mother Yashoda, even she has to do her best. Even she has to put all her endeavor. She's chasing, and he's making her work for it. It's not like, at a certain point, you just kind of cruise in devotional life. Even when you get to Goloka Vrindavan, you might be milking cows for a long time. Who knows what we're going to be doing. But of course, there's a lot of pleasure. Now we think about that, like, oh my gosh, maybe it's not so bad down here. I've got my house, I don't have to milk any cows. <laughs> just go to work, it's not so bad, you know? Go to temple on Sundays. But obviously, there's a whole different consciousness, and it's blissful. But even in the spiritual world, see, Krishna is making all the devotees work. But he's, he's also working. You know, it's hard work to go, to go into people's homes and eat their butter. <laughs> like, that's easy. You have to go to every single home, make sure all the devotees are satisfied, that get to see him. He's personally going to give darshan. Imagine if Krishna is going to everybody's house to give darshan. That's what he's doing. He's working harder than everyone. They have to churn a little butter, but he's got, he's got a whole schedule every day. <laughs> you know? His, like, calendar is full. You know, it's like, because how many gopis are there? Unlimited, by the way. So he's never, you know, stopping to give darshan. So he's working harder than everyone else to make, please all the devotees, right? to please the cows. He's, he's on call 24-7. <laughs> so, so ultimately, seeing her endeavor, seeing her de endeavor, he allows her to bind him. And then, now Krishna's not happy being bound up like this. So he calls his friends, Madhu Mangal and others, say, hey, come, come, untie me. Let me get me out of here. So they come, and they're not, they're not able to untie him. And that's really interesting. Why are they not able to untie Krishna? Does anybody know? That's true. Yes, yes. So because the rope was tied with mother's, the Mother Yashoda's love, which was in Vatsalya Ras, which is higher than Sakya Ras. So it was tied with the, her love from a higher Ras, so they couldn't untie it because they were a slightly lower Ras. Right? It's really interesting. So, so we can see that here, Mother Yashoda had to do so much endeavor right? just to get the best milk, and she, that even meant having to bind up Krishna, having to bind him up so that she could do her seva. And of course, she doesn't have any idea that this is the Supreme Personality of God that I'm uh, tying up now. And what's really fascinating, I think, about this story is, you know, the whole planet and much of the universe is, is afraid of God. The idea is you fear God. And why? Because he's so powerful, he punishes you. And we have this really unique perspective on the Supreme Lord. You know, our perspective is we have a God who is afraid and who cries and he trembles in fear of Mother Yashoda. Where the whole other, the rest of the planet is trembling because they're afraid God is going to punish them. But our unique perspective and angle brought to us by Mahaprabhu and the Acharyas is our God is actually just the opposite. He's crying, he's trembling, and he's running away in fear. Very, very opposite conception. And we can see it's so sweet because we've heard these stories a thousand times. We've probably told them hundreds of times, but it's so pleasurable to hear them and tell them over and over again. Because there's something transcendental about these stories. So she was willing to do whatever was needed, all sacrifice, just to make sure that Krishna could be pleased, even if that meant tying him up. So then ultimately Krishna goes, decides that he's no longer going to wait there. It's like kids are very restless, they can't sit in one spot. So he decides he's going to go, he has some service to do, right? He has some service to do. So he goes into the courtyard and there's these Arjuna trees. And he pulls the grinding mortar in between the two of them, and they fall down, making a loud noise. And these two effulgent personalities come out. And we go from this incredibly sweet pastime of 
Krishna, Krishna stealing butter from the gopis and Mother Yashoda trying to tie him. It's really sweet. To a pastime that's a, a little bit more, in one sense, serious. Because now, these two great personalities that came out, we know how they got in the trees. They were the sons of Kuvera. Very wealthy, very powerful. And they were also very close to Lord Shiva. So because they had so much prestige, and sometimes you get fame, and sometimes you can also get fame by being close to somebody famous. And you become famous because of that, that, that proximity. So they were very close to Lord Shiva. So they had a lot of fame and a lot of wealth, and they were also very good looking. They were demigods. So they were bathing in the Ganga, right? and with the denizens, with the damsels of the heavenly planets, and they were drunk. And now what's interesting is, when Narad Muni came, the ladies had enough sense to cover themselves up and get out of there. But these guys were so drunk, they didn't actually think they needed to do anything. They just thought it was okay because, hey, we're, we're, we're friends with Lord Shiva or our father's Kuvera. We control the wealth of the universe. It's, you know, all of these, you know, I mean, honestly, when we get a little bit of prestige or a little money or a nice car or a nice position at work, we get proud of that. We may not admit it, but it's in there. We know it's there if we're honest about it. It's like brewing. It's like itching in the heart. Now, the, now these individuals had everything. And what's interesting is if you think about how offensive it is what they were doing, they were, so when you bathe in the Ganga, you're not supposed to bathe in the Ganga naked. You have to have some cloth on the lower portion of your body. You have to have something on. Not only were they naked in the Ganga, they were drunk in the Ganga, and they were engaging in illicit activities with women in the Ganges. So when you think about all of that, you realize that we're going from a very sweet pastime to something a little bit more serious and something that's much more instructive for us. Right? Because really what's being taught here is how maddening <coughs> pride and prestige can really be. It's just so powerful because it can completely blind us to even the most obvious moral and ethical behaviors. It can blind us to the most obvious moral and ethical behaviors. If we become proud enough of the things we have, or the things we know, or the people we know, or the positions that we carry, we become blind. Like, here is Narad Muni, who can deliver anyone, curse anyone, and they just don't bother doing anything. They just keep going as if nothing had happened. Even when all the ladies left, they were like, something should have, a bell should have rung for them. Like, okay, maybe there's something wrong here. But just imagine, they just kept going and not stopping. So Narad Muni, out of his incredible mercy, curses them that if you like being naked, go ahead and become naked like trees. But he would allow them to remember who they were the whole time. And they were going to be cursed for, to be there for hundreds of thousands, millions of years, actually. Pretty severe punishment. And of course, Krishna liberates them. And he even tells them that you'll no longer fall down from the spiritual realm. Right? Let me see if I have the verse here. So, Lord Krishna tells them, O Nala Puvara and Mani Griva, now you may both return home since you desire to be always absorbed in my devotional service. Your desire to develop love and affection for me will be fulfilled, and now you will never fall from that platform. Really interesting, right? So, now Krishna only went to that courtyard, not because he really, for them, but because Narada had told them that you'll be liberated when Krishna liberates you. That's the only reason, because he didn't really know them, he didn't, they hadn't done some devotional service to attract Krishna's attention. Now, what's interesting is because we're talking about endeavor and mercy. 
And they got the supreme mercy. Of course, they had to pay a very heavy price, standing there as trees, maintaining a consciousness of a human being for millions of birth. That's a very heavy price to pay. But they get liberated. I was thinking about this, and I didn't come up with an answer, but I'll share my thought with you anyways. I was thinking, if it's all about endeavor and mercy, what was their endeavor to get this mercy? It's causeless. But it's interesting that right after the, the pastime of two inches, the endeavor and mercy, with us, immediately Krishna goes into this pastime of no endeavor, full mercy. Right? Nothing on their part. All they did was become very offensive to Narada and the Ganga. Entering the Ganga naked, being drunk in the Ganga, and having illicit affairs in the Ganga, and neglecting a pure devotee. We know what happened to Indra when he neglected his own guru because he had become puffed up and proud. He thought he didn't have to stand up when his guru walked into the assembly. We've seen this so many times. So in this situation, I was thinking it's really interesting that we're going from a pastime in which endeavor and mercy are the key theme of this pastime, and this next pastime, where they're liberated, there's really no endeavor on their part. And then you realize that ultimately, it's Krishna's mercy. That the pure devotee, really that is the mercy that we're aspiring for. We're really aspiring for the mercy of the pure devotees to serve them in such a way that they will bless us. Because if they bless us, then Krishna is bound by their blessing. If they bless us, then Krishna has to fulfill their blessing. And, I, and so this is a, just a very interesting transition from one pastime to the other. Where Mother Yashoda, a pure devotee, is working so hard to bind Krishna. So hard. And he's ruining her butter, he's distributing the butter, he's doing all kinds of, making all kinds of mess. And then you have Nalokuvera Mani Griva. Right? Of course, like I said, the, pa the price they did pay was that they stand as trees with full consciousness. And I don't think we can imagine how difficult and painful that must be. And I don't know if, any, if, if somebody told us that, you know what, how about this? After a million lives or in a million years, you'll see Krishna. But for those million years, you have to be a tree. I mean, I would be like, I'll take my chances. Thank you very much. I'll go to the Sunday feast, chant and dance. And really hope, you know, I'll get the blessings, right? I mean, that's it's definitely a heavy price to pay that they did. You know, it wasn't a simple thing. It wasn't an easy thing. But it also shows how, how rare it is to have this association. And there's um, one of the purports from the 10th canto, the 10th chapter, verse 5 says, and it's quoting the Chaitanya Char Charitamrita Madhya Lila, saying that out of many... One who is very fortunate gets an opportunity to associate with a bona fide spiritual master by the grace of Krishna. By the mercy of both Krishna and the spiritual master, such a person receives the seed of the creeper of devotional service. Narada appeared in the garden to give the two sons of Kubera the seed of devotional service. So he didn't show up to curse them. It's interesting. He didn't come there to curse them. <laughs> And you're always wondering, what was going through his mind? Of course, who can imagine the mind of a pure devotee? But he wasn't thinking, I'm going to curse them. He's thinking, I'm going to give them the seed of devotional service. And he's thinking this about people who are engaging in like the worst kind of like offensive behavior. Because it's in the holy Ganga also, whatever they're doing. It's in the Ganga. <laughs> they're doing it all in the Ganga. Right? And... So he appeared in the guard to give these two sons of Korea the seed of devotional service, even though they were intoxicated. Saintly persons know how to bestow mercy upon the fallen souls. So, of course, this the verse we read is, this is the instruction of Lord Chaitanya to Rupa Goswami. Right? That out of many, many millions of births, right? There's hardly going to be one individual. Because most people who come to spiritual life, they come because they want, you know, dharma, artha, kama, moksha. And then there's some who actually want liberation. And then there are those who, rare, very rare, who actually engage in devotional service. And even of those, it's even more rare to find one who actually is going to find a bona fide spiritual master. It's so rare to come across a bona fide spiritual master. And yet, 
you know, we can take hope in this, that these individuals, I don't know what their history of their previous life was. Maybe there's some explanation, like they did some service to sadhus, or I don't know that history. But here it comes Narad Muni to give them absolute pure cause of mercy. They got to see Narad Muni. They got to see Narad Muni. And then personally, Krishna gets to, not only do they get to see the Lord face to face, which happens when we develop prema. We only get to see Krishna when we actually develop prema. That's when we get to see Krishna face to face. And they're getting to see Krishna face to face. Not only that, he's speaking with them. You know? He's speaking to them, says, you're, you know, you're blessed, you go to my abode, and you won't have to fall back down. So, you know, and we are, I think, very fortunate because you know, Prabhupada created this incredible society where if you just look around, it's just all devotees. It's just all devotees. And so in one sense, making advancement should, for us should be very easy because we're just surrounded by devotees. But Mahaprabhu, of course, said that as long as you don't, it's just chant the holy names and don't offend the devotees. So being around that many devotees creates great opportunities and also great risk. <laughs> right? It's like a razor's edge. Right? Devotional service is like a razor's edge. A razor can shave, but it can also cut if you're not careful. So being around devotees, even if they're a new devotee, especially if they're senior. So if we're able to adjust sort of our mindset and really see that, you know, we're just, Prabhupada just created an institution and he filled it with devotees. And when we come in, we're surrounded by devotees. That's it. It, that's all we see. And if we can just be thoughtful and mature and intelligent enough to deal with each other in a way with that consciousness that everyone around me is a devotee, we don't know who's how pure. We really don't know. Like, like if, if we were to walk by seeing these two doing what they were doing, we'd have the most offensive mentality towards them. Right? And that's probably right to have that kind of mentality. But we don't know who's doing what and where they're at in their spiritual life. We really don't know. You know, somebody could be doing all kinds of abominable activities, but maybe they're this far from Krishna, right there. Maybe they're just a little bit more. Somehow Krishna's going to purify them and take them back. Where we're doing everything perfectly, but we may just be starting the path. As so we're judging the person who's having some difficulty, but they're like, they're just like one exit away. Right? They're one exit away to Goloka, where we're just on exit one of the turnpike and we have to go to like exit 20. You know, it's going to take a while. You know? So maybe the person on exit one has stopped off at the service area and is just like taking his time, you know? But we're like, oh, look, they're wasting their time. But we don't know. We don't know how many stops we're going to take before we get there. It could be 20 lives before we get to <laughs> that final exit. We don't know, actually. So. And it's hard to make, you know, especially when you get to know each other, it's hard to uh, kind of keep this in mind that everybody around me is a devotee and all I have to do is serve and you know, befriend devotees. But really, I think that's our biggest and biggest, cons not concern, our biggest challenge. Right? And, and in this month of Karthi, if we can really endeavor to see other devotees in that way, you know, and especially, and, and I'll, I'm going to throw out one advice that I throw out when I do my corporate talks. <laughs> especially if you have a, a devotee that you have difficulty with, or you don't see eye to eye with, really take some time to think of their positive qualities. Take some time and think about the good qualities they have and the wonderful service that they're doing. Really try to shift your mindset about that individual. Otherwise, your mindset is constantly being offensive and you're offending that person and that Krishna's not happy every time you do that. So every time you see that person, try to think of something positive and even before you see them, try to see them in some kind of a positive way. So that's my sort of, I want to give that as a takeaway for you. You know, anyone you see, any devotee especially, that you have a difficult time with, 
take a little, do a little meditation, think of their positive qualities and think of the positive service they're doing because you have to shift your mindset. Otherwise your mindset will be very offensive and you're not gonna be making as much progress as you could be. So, do we have time for, I know it's 7.30, do we have time for a question or should we just end right now? A couple of questions. We can take a couple of questions. Yes, Prabhu. Thank you, Prabhu. So, very nice, wonderful class. I, you were explaining a lot of, a lot of the things about the milk. So I just want to ask you, being in the corporate world and like right now as we see, people are directly becoming from non-vegetarian to vegan because a lot of the cow abuse is going on in the commercial milk industry. Um, I recently came across a few people and they say, why do we have to drink cow's milk? And I tried to give them the you know, scriptural perspective that Krishna, uh, cows are very dear to Krishna and in scriptures also it mentioned that the finest tissues in the brain developed by ghee from the cow, cow's ghee and milk. Are there any other things that you think of that, of course, you know, saving cows and treating them right is the fundamental thing. Other than that, what is the importance of cow and why should you continue to, you know, use cow's milk? So, if you're talking to outsiders, they don't care what the scripture says. It's completely useless for them. Right. So the only thing you can do is get some research. I don't, haven't done that research because that's not the stuff. I don't get into that kind of conversation in companies. But you can. I'm sure there's plenty of research. And if you can show that research, that's the only way they're going to believe it. Like whenever I, I talk about vegetarianism in a corporation, I have to bring some research. Like Harvard Health Review says that it causes heart attack and high cholesterol and stroke. <laughs> So if you want to be more productive, stop eating this stuff. You know, have more energy during the, in the you know in, during the work day. So I think you need to be able to have some. I'm sure you can easily find research, uh, you know, scientific research in a simplified way, talking about the benefit of you know cow's milk. We do it because Prabhupada told us to, right? We were just we were doing all kinds of things before, so we, we stopped doing many things and we started doing many things because Prabhupada told us to. So. Devotees, that's one thing. If it's outsiders, you got to find some relevant research, something simple, like, you know, this university did this research, and they showed that the people who are drinking this kind of milk had better health. Like, oh, okay, that's the research you have to find that will satisfy them. Scriptures, I wouldn't, you know, it's not going to mean anything to them, unless they're a very pious Hindu. Mm -hmm. Yes, Prabhu. Very nice class. Thank you, Prabhu. <clears throat> the question I had, as you mentioned, right, in this month of Karthik, any small devotional service, you know, it goes into a thousand benefits, a thousand times benefit. Really think about it, like, we are, I've been at least, uh, many people have been doing for years, years together, the devotional service, not only in the month of Karthik and also other months as well. But in reality, we don't see that we are still undergoing those sufferings and other things. Right? How do we reconcile that, okay, if we perform this devotional service, the scripture says that you get thousand, thousand times benefits, all your sins are eradicated, but in practically, if you see, you are undergoing those sufferings again and again. So how do we... Well, I think that one is... the question? Oh, the, yeah, yeah. The question is that in the Kardik, all our devotional service multiplied by a thousand times, but we're still going through our suffering and difficulty, so how do we know it's really helping us? I think we have to remember that we've been in this material world for millions of lives, and in those millions of lives, we've accumulated so much karma, so much of it, that it's probably going to take a little while for all of it to get washed away. Just like when we're, if you've been rolling around in the mud, you turn on the shower, depending on how long, how hard the mud is dried, it's going to take a while for the mud to wash off. You can be like, oh, I'm in the shower, it should have been off now. Right? But it's just going to take a little while. And the point is, really we're trying to love, we're not just trying to wash off our karma, we're trying to love Krishna. If we just aim for that, then all the other stuff will be taken care of. Right? So our goal is just to love Krishna, and then our karma will be taken care of. And ultimately, we don't know, just like Narad Muni, we don't know at the time of death. Right now, we may be going through all our karmic reactions and purification and suffering. But at the time of death, we don't know if Krishna might just show up in our mind. And we may just see Krishna, we may see Gorna Thai, and we go back to Godhead. So uh, there's been a lot of, you know, I've heard stories of robot disciples who maybe weren't practicing bhakti for a while and at the time of death they just remembered Prabhupada, they saw Prabhupada, they could see Prabhupada coming to them. So 
we just keep going, doing our devotional service as nicely as possible, not offending devotees. Ultimately, we leave it up to Krishna how and when we go back to God. You know? And we just have to fill our mind with all our senses with devotional service and devotional items. And then at the time of death, if we've filled up enough, Krishna will make sure that he shows up and helps us into the next stage. So how and when that happens, we don't know. But with faith, we just keep going. One more, yes. But you said Kubiras do some what endeavor they did. Um, so and over there I just want to like they just uh, remember like the millions and millions years that Krishna will come and deliver us. The many Damodar once went and they just waiting for Krishna. Is that, is that not endeavor? It is. It is. Um, I was saying that initially, what did they do, right, to get that kind of mercy initially? But that was already going to happen now. Once they were in the tree form, Krishna was already going to come and deliver them, right? But yes, during that time, their meditation was, when is Krishna going to come? So they were definitely very deeply <laughs> thinking of Krishna, very desperately thinking of Krishna. So that was Narayamuni's brilliance in one sense, is that put him in a way that all they're going to be thinking of is, When's Krishna coming? When's Krishna coming? We really want to see Krishna. So you can see the way Narad, when he does it, he's so brilliant. He just knows what to do and how to adjust people's consciousness. And that was the perfect thing they needed to happen to really be humble. And 24-7, yuga after yuga, they were only thinking of one person. Right? So that was a lot of blessing, actually, in one sense, you know? So, thank you. Thank you.